Hello, Inland Valley Church. Well, here we are again doing this online. Um, I saw that we have some members that uh, are dealing with COVID right now. So it's good that we're able to take a break. Um, let's remember them in our prayers. Um, also, uh, Uncle Don, for those of you who don't know, has been in the hospital. Doesn't appear to be COVID related. Um, and I've been getting updates, um, nothing too serious. Um, so let's remember him in our prayers also. Okay, we are in John 14. And um, we're going to be in John 14 verses 1 through 18 today. And I would just like to go ahead and start by reading the first 11 verses. So John 14, 1 through 11. Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. That's what we went over last week. Uh, if you missed that and you're interested, maybe you'd be able to go back and find that. Verse 5, <clears throat> Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, and how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also, and from now on, you know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority. But the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the work themselves. Um, verse one, when we, like I said, we went over that last week, but it starts off saying, let not your heart be troubled. And in the, uh, the Greek language that this is translated out of, what this is saying in plain English is, don't think wrong. Now, I don't know if that's proper English, and I don't know how that translates to Spanish. But Jesus is saying, don't think wrong. Um, he has just spent, you know, three and a half years with these guys. And he is, the, the disciples have seen all the works that Jesus has done. And they've been in some tight spots together. They've seen mobs try to stone Jesus to take his life. And he's always been able to slip away. And they've seen all that. Um, so they are feeling very safe. And um, feeling like there's, there's nothing that can take them out. But this is the night before Jesus' crucifixion. And he needs to prepare them. He's telling them, I'm going to be leaving. Um, and he knows that they are going to be scared and they're going to feel lost and they're going to think like this was all for nothing. Um, because he knows what their state of mind is going to be, especially until they see him resurrected. So he says, you know, let not your heart be troubled. Don't think wrong about this. And he gives them some reassurance. You believe in God, you believe, believe in me. Um, I'm going to prepare a place for you and I'm going to come back for you. Um, and then when Philip says, you know, in verse eight, when Philip says, show us the father and it is sufficient for us. And he said, and Jesus says, 
Have I been with you so long and you have not known me, Philip? You've seen me, you've seen the Father. Now, obviously, Jesus is not talking. He's not saying that he is the exact physical um, appearance of God. He's not saying, me and God, you know, if you were to lay eyes on each one of us, you wouldn't be able to tell us apart. And that's not what Jesus is saying. He's obviously talking spiritual talk here. And as we get into this next section, we're going to see exactly what Jesus is talking about. Uh, verse 10. Do you not believe that I'm in the Father and the Father is in me? And then what does he say? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Now that sounds a little bit funny because he starts off talking about words and he ends up talking about works and it doesn't quite seem to go together. Um, so what Jesus is saying is, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He's saying that the words that I speak are not mine. They're the Father's words. And he's saying that the works that I do are not mine. They're the Father's works. So what he's saying is, look at what I say and look at what I do, and you'll have a perfect representation of the Father. So in verse 12, he says, most Surely, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do, and greater works than these will he do, what he will do, because I go to my Father. Um, let me just start off as I kind of break down this section by saying that the idea is not that we do miracles, okay? The idea is. <clears throat> that we speak the words of God so that he can work, he can do works in his people. There's a passage in Luke 10, verse 17 through 20, <clears throat> that I'd like to read. Luke 10, 17 through 20. Now, I just want to want to read this to point out the priority that Jesus puts on the miracles as opposed to obeying the words, okay? Verse 17, then the 70 returned with joy saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. There's, there, there was the, the group that Jesus sent out and they were able to cast out demons in the name of Jesus. They were able to do these miracles and listen to what Jesus's response is. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on servants, serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Now listen to this. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you. Rather, rejoice because your names are written in heaven. So Jesus is taking this uh, victory that these, these guys were having um, over the realm of Satan. And they were able to cast these demons out in the name of Jesus. And Jesus is going, look, there's something more important than you guys going out and performing these, these, these victories over the spirit realm. And that is that you have salvation. It's basically what Jesus is saying. The miracles are great. But the fact that you have salvation is much more important. Don't rejoice over the works. Rejoice over your salvation. And that gives us a little bit of perspective um, as, we, as we're looking back at this other passage in John where, where he says, hey, the things that I'm going to do, you're going to do, and you're going to do even greater things than me. Um, so I'm trying to give us an idea as to what those greater things might be. There's another passage in uh, Matthew, Matthew 7, 22 and 23, 7, 22 and 23 says this, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name and done many wonders in your name. And then I will declare to them, 
I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So here's some people that were doing the same thing. They, they had power over the demonic realm and being able to cast out spirits and do these other wonders. And Jesus is like, I don't even know who you are. It kind of gives us a little bit of perspective. Now that we're going to go back into our um, passage in John. When Jesus says, you know, the works that I do, you're going to do. In fact, you're even going to do greater works than I do. Doing the works without abiding in his word misses the whole point. Um, you remember the story of Mary and Martha when uh, Jesus was at their house and Martha was busy working and Mary was sitting at Jesus' feet. Um, and Martha says, hey, Jesus, I got a lot to do. Will you tell Mary to come in here and give me a hand? And what did Jesus say? She's chosen the better part. Telling us that sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening to his words, abiding in his words, establishing that relationship between us and him is more important than the works. The works that, in this case, the works that Martha was doing. In, 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 our, in our text, um, the works of the miracles. Relationship with Jesus is more important. Um, don't rejoice if God works a miracle through you. Rejoice that you have salvation. Rejoice that you have um, relationship with Jesus. That's what it's all about. Leading others into that relationship is what Jesus is talking about um, doing greater works than he did. Now, that doesn't seem to make any sense to us, but Jesus isn't here where the world can put their eyes on him. We know that he's in us. We know that he's all around us. But for someone who's not yet converted, they don't have that experience. What they see is you and what they see is me. And speaking the words of God to bring someone into a relationship with Jesus so that they now have the salvation that Jesus was saying that we need to rejoice about. I think that is more along the lines of the greater works that Jesus is talking about. Um, you know, what's the, what's the greater miracle that Jesus did? Is it to say to a, a lame man, take up your bed and walk? Or is it to say to that same man, your sins are forgiven. Based on what we're looking at here, it's easy to say the better miracle is the forgiveness of sins. The better miracle is bringing people into a relationship and leading them in the way of salvation. Um, one, more, one more verse I want to go over. Luke 15, 7 says this. I say to you that there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. So let's let that sink in. Um, when someone receives salvation, there's a party in heaven. Right? That, that's what it says. Um, there's more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents. Now, you may say, well, I've got a good friend who told me about this supernatural thing that happened, this miracle that happened. Somebody was, was miraculously healed. I have too. Uh, it's happened to me. It's happened to my wife. And I'm well aware of all that. But to receive that miracle and not receive salvation is what's the point? It, it's, it's for no reason it's it's the the receiving salvation leading other people into salvation that brings joy to heaven that jesus says this is what you should rejoice over 
all this other stuff, yeah, it, it can be a means to an end, but the big payoff at the end is salvation. That's the thing that, that really needs to grab our attention. Um, I mean, let's face it, miracles can be few and far between. And if we're going to base our, our faith and our walk on, well, gosh, I haven't seen a miracle in three years. I wonder if God's still there. That it's the wrong lens to look through this from. We have salvation. We take the words of Jesus to those around us that don't have it. And if God decides to use some sort of miraculous turn of events to get that person's attention, man, that's great. That's great. But the salvation at the end, that's what makes it. That's what makes it. That's what makes it all worthwhile. And that's what Jesus is talking about when he says greater works. Um, you know, he spent three and a half years with these disciples. And at the end of that three and a half years, after he was crucified, there was a group of Christians in an upper room. And with everything that Jesus did, over a period of three and a half years, them seeing it with their own eyes, you know how many people were in that upper room? 120, 120. When Peter gave that first sermon and he was, he was using the words of God, he was speaking the words of God to the people with the anointing of the Holy Spirit that was over him. And in that one sermon, 3,000 people received salvation. 3,000 people were saved. Jesus had 120 waiting in an upper room for what was going to come next. Peter gets one sermon and 3,000 people are saved. That's a picture of what, of what this is talking about. Greater works will we do. Um, we're here now. People see us now. People see you now. Will you speak the words of God as you go through your life so that people will know? What are you talking about, though? Thing? I, I haven't heard that. Maybe they'll say, I have heard that. Those people are all hypocrites. How will the world know us? By our love. We have love. And we speak the words of God. And the Holy Spirit can do his work. And people come to salvation. And that's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. That's why Jesus came. Jesus came to fix what was messed up, to redeem the plan, to restore us to relationship with the Father. That's what it's all about. Um, in verse 13 and 14, I just want to touch on this. It says, and whatever you ask in my name, that I will do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. And if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Okay, so I'm going to say this prayer. God, please give everyone at Inland Valley Church a brand new Porsche in their driveway right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, go check your driveways. I'll wait. You got one? You didn't get one? It didn't work? Jesus is lying. Um, we need to understand what he means when he says asking in his name. Um, in the Hebrew culture, when words like this are used, when it says, um, like it does right here, ask in my name. In my name is synonymous with um, in line with my character. So we could say, whatever you ask the Father that is in line with my character, and it's Jesus talking, I will do it. Okay. Now, this is a pretty bold statement. And we can know in our head that, you know, if we ask God something, that is according to his will, we, you know he's going he, to say yes to that. That's a prayer that we can pray that we know he's going to say yes. Um, 
But because we pray something that is in line with the character of Jesus, um, it doesn't mean that the answer is going to come about easily. Let me explain. We ask anything that is in line with the character of Jesus. He will do it. Okay, there's, um, there's a sin I'm struggling with, and I keep falling to it. I keep falling to it, and I keep falling to it, and I keep repenting, and I keep saying, God, please, please help me to stop doing this. And then I do it again, and, I, ah, and the guilt and the shame come in, um, which is from Satan. That's how he's going to attack you when something like that happens. The guilt and the shame coming. He's oh, I'm such a failure. God, please, please make it so that I don't do this anymore. Can I tell you that to that prayer, God says yes. He says yes, I will. Yes, I will. Every time we pray it, God's answer is yes, I will do that. I will make it so that you don't fall to that temptation anymore. But that doesn't mean it's going to be easy. God wants to strengthen us. He wants to improve our character. And if saying a prayer like that meant, boom, I never have to deal with that temptation again, it doesn't necessarily serve God's purposes to answer those prayers in that way. Um, what's that old saying? Um, God loves you just the way that you are, but he loves you too much to let you stay that way. He wants us to grow. Um, and it's something that I struggle with. You know, one of the hardest things is, is when things get difficult, um, it's real easy for me to quit. Um, and I know that about myself. And it's something that I, that I work on. But we can have the confidence that Whatever we ask that is in line with the character of Jesus, his answer will be yes, but that doesn't mean that it's going to be easy. Now, on the other hand, we can pray for um, salvation of a loved one, salvation of a family member. And is that in line with the character of Jesus? Well, yes, absolutely it is. But that doesn't mean that God is going to make that person accept him against their will. Um, so these are all things that we have to wrestle with and that we have to be um, mindful of. But we know that when we can ask something that is in line with the character of Jesus, that God's answer to it will be yes. A couple more verses and we'll go ahead and wind this up. Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. This is verse 15. And I will pray the Father and he will give you another helper. And some translations might say, uh, instead of helper, you <clears throat> might say comforter. Remember that word, because we're going to come to it again later. That he will give you another helper or comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Now, we know this is talking about the Holy Spirit. And just let me say right here that he may abide with you forever. You know, we're still going to be filled with the Holy Spirit in heaven. And I just have a feeling that it's just going to really go up and up and up to higher and higher levels. Because we're not going to be dealing with the fallen state of this world all around us. We're going to be living in perfection, absence of sin, absence of desire to sin. And that's where we're really going to get a, a feel for the power of the Holy Spirit that is in us. That he may abide with you forever. Verse 17. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Verse 18, I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you again. Now, if you're following along in another translation, 
it may say, or another word for orphans, it can be translated comfortless. Okay, I will not leave you comfortless. Um, it's not exactly the idea we think of when we think of orphans, just kids without parents. Um, although that picture does also work. But it's interesting that Jesus says, I will pray the Father and he will give you another helper. I will not leave, or he will give you another comforter. I will, in, in verse 16, and then in verse 18, he says, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. So, Jesus is about to, his physical presence is about to leave his disciples. He's going to be crucified. He's going to be put in the tomb. And he kind of knows what they're going to go through. After all, he is 100% man and 100% God. He knows what they're going to be going through, the struggles that they're going to be having. So he's saying, hey, don't let your heart be troubled. Don't think wrong. You, you need to shift the way that you're thinking, and we need to do the same. We need to shift the way that we're thinking. Our focus, our perspective, needs to be on eternity. Eternal um, life in the presence of God in heaven, in the place that Jesus has gone to prepare for us. We have that to look forward to. Um, doing greater works than Jesus did, using our love and the words that God has given us, the, the words of God, the words of Jesus to bring salvation to people who are living, you know, hopeless lives. They may not even realize that they're living hopeless lives. And we see in this passage of scripture, we see Jesus, we see the Father, and we see the Holy Spirit all laid out right here and how they all work together just in this little bit of scripture that, that we've looked at. Um, I was, when we lived in Texas, had a knock at the door one evening. So I went to the door and there was these two young ladies at the door and what they were were, um, you know, the Mormon, the, the pairs of the Mormon young men that come around and knock on the doors and they have the title of um, elder. Um, and they're going around and, and trying to evangelize in the community. Well, this is two young women. They go by the title of sister. So these were two Mormon sisters. And they came and, and knocked on the door. And they started talking to me about, uh, about their beliefs and their teachings. <clears throat> And I knew that they didn't, that, that they don't believe in the Trinity that we see right here, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They don't believe that that's a, that that's a real thing. But they do believe in eternity. So I got to talking to them, and I came around to this point where I says, well, what do you think about the Trinity? And they go, oh. We don't, we don't really believe in the Trinity. I said, really? Why not? And they said, well, and I don't know if these were their answers or the answers that they were told to give, but they said, well, we, we just can't wrap our heads around that. And I said, you believe in eternity? Oh, yeah, we believe in eternity. I said, how do you wrap your head around that? I mean, think about it. You can wrap your head around eternity? but you can't wrap your head around the Trinity. Now I bring that up to say this. We cannot, like these girls did, limit our understanding of God and what he can do, Jesus and what he can do, Holy Spirit and what he can do. In fact, don't let me say what they can do. Let me say what they do, what God does, what Jesus does, what the Holy Spirit does in our lives. We cannot limit an infinite God to what we can wrap our head around. So as we go through this next week, um, 
Let's look for opportunities. If you want opportunities, if we pray for opportunities, we read that, well, that's definitely in line with the character of Jesus, isn't it? Because that's the whole point. He'll give us opportunities. It doesn't mean it's going to be easy. It's going to be uncomfortable. There'll be a learning curve. But God has great works in mind for us to do for him. Great works. And it has to do with bringing people in the world that don't know God into a relationship and to bring them into salvation. So I double dog dare you. Look for somebody to talk, talk to about God this week. Thank you so much for your time. We'll see you next week. Don't forget to pray for our members. Uh, let's keep us all safe and healthy and bring the health back to those that are, that are dealing with the COVID. Remember Uncle Don and anybody that I haven't mentioned, you know, send out an email, make sure other people know so that we can all be covering each other in prayer. Thank you so much. Bye. Okay, as we do every week, um, let's uh, take this time to commune with our Lord. Um, any good. Um, there's so much more I can say, but I have a feeling I've said enough already. <laughs> um, there's, there's just cool stuff in here if, if you want to find it. God is so good and God is so amazing. And um, thank God, thank the Father that Jesus came. Um, thank the Father that uh, he loves us like he does. And thank you, Jesus, for the, gosh, what you went through to redeem us back to a relationship with him. So let's take a moment, let's pray for the communion and you go ahead and have communion. Father, I, I just thank you for your son. Jesus, I thank you for what you did. Holy Spirit, I thank you for coming into our lives. And I, um, I just pray that you will draw us closer to you. Pray that you will soften our hearts, that we will be more useful for you. And um, I just thank you so much for eternity in heaven that we have to look forward to. Help us to keep that in the front of our brains and let that be the perspective that we look at this life through. In Jesus' name, amen.